Hi there, thanks for joining me for episode 11 of Gravity, the digital marketing agency podcast. I'm Bob Gentle and every week I'm joined by small digital marketing agency owners and solo practitioners just like you. Whether you run your own business or you're just thinking of stepping out on your own for the first time, you're in the right place. While you're getting settled in, just take a moment to subscribe to this show on your podcast player. It only takes a second and then you won't miss a single episode. Just pause for a second and do it right now. In this week's episode, I'm speaking to Lee Jackson. Lee runs a web development agency called Angled Crown. Lee's agency gets so many things right, and they've really innovated the small agency model. I'm really excited to share them with you. So welcome to episode 11, and let's meet Lee. Lee Jackson from Angled Crown, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Uh, why don't you start by just telling me a little bit about your business, where you are, what you do. That kind sure. Of thing. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It was great to see you at the Upreneur Summit. Really, really enjoyed hanging out with everyone. Um, my company, yes, is Angled Crown, and we've specialized in helping design agencies around the world convert their designs into WordPress-driven websites. So that is literally all we do. That's our niche within a niche. And we target design agencies and we work on WordPress themes for those design agencies only. Essentially, they'll send us the picture and we'll do the code, which is great fun. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say around the world, so where is your typical client? Literally around the world. We've got clients in America, Australia, Germany, Italy, Spain, um, obviously England as well. So uh, we've not yet done China or Japan, but that's mainly due to the fact that I have no <laughs> idea what I'm reading when I look at all those characters. So knowing your business a little bit, you're not big in terms of scale. So how many projects would you have on the go at any one time? Sure. So the way we operate is we'll work on a, only a few higher value projects. So we've got a small team. Mm. Uh, we're a team of four people, but we also have extra people that we can switch on and off. Not like robots, but they're all contractors. Um, we try and operate with no more than two to three projects on at any one time. And um, the way we do our project management as well is we have all of our projects stacked on top of each other in a huge mega Gantt chart so that we can make sure that we're not overlapping because obviously one project may be six months long versus another that will be two months long or a month. So we make sure we're operating on the high value end of the projects. So usually in the 10, 20, 30K projects, et cetera, um, which allow us to take our time, do a really, really good job and, uh, you know, uh, not have to back to back. I mean, five years ago, I was back to backing really low cost WordPress themes, which was ridiculous because I was working all hours and it was super stressful. Yeah, I was going to say that, that very, very disciplined. I mean, I come from a, a web designer background, so I have a fair mm. inkling as, as to how that goes. The scenario you described a few years ago of back to backing lots and lots of low value mm -hmm. projects, that's normal. What's quite unusual and I really like what you've done there is having a small number of very high value projects. That's really the holy grail for a lot of web designers, but they don't manage to achieve it well, very often. Within that as well, we do still do the three to 5k projects as well. Um, but the way we do those is those will be on an agreement that we're using some sort of framework to rapidly develop whatever it is we're doing. And very often between those high value projects, we may have, you know, two or three weeks of not really that much to do. So, you know, I'm not yeah. dumb. If someone's got a 3K project and they're happy for us to use one of our frameworks, which is going to allow us to do it rapidly, as opposed to hand coding absolutely everything, um, then we'll certainly take that project on as well. So we, we do intersperse the smaller jobs as well, but we just have that agreement that that's not going to be uh, hand stitched, as it were, handcrafted. That's going to be using a combination of tools like an existing framework, like uh, the Beaver Thema. If people are aware of WordPress, you've got Beaver Thema, uh, et cetera, that allows you to visually build up a lot of the website. And we also have a whole lot of modules we've already created that we can then reutilize. And obviously that's been built up over the last few years. So one thing I really want to home in on, because this isn't a web designer podcast, this is a digital marketing podcast. And you've clearly done something quite interesting in the way that you've managed to reach out to an audience in order to sustain you with those larger projects. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've achieved that? Obviously not giving away any secrets, but 
<laughs> just to paint a picture of as, as to how I you've got to admit, I give away all my secrets because it's all on the podcast. <laughs> okay. um, so the way, all right. So rewinding five years ago, it was just me and a couple of, well, me, one full-time employee and a couple of contractors. And we were working on the low cost projects and I was really struggling to, attract my target audience. I was doing a lot of local networking. I'm getting the odd good project doing local networking, etc. But really struggling to connect with those bigger design agencies and just struggling generally to build up my own online network of people that I could be connected with. That's both suppliers and uh, and obviously clients. So I listened to a lot of podcasts and thought, you know what, I'm going to start a podcast because, well, for two, re- three reasons I started the podcast. Number one uh, was that I just needed to learn stuff. And I thought the best way of learning is to get the experts in and ask them the questions I need to know the answers to. (laughs) So that was the the first reason. (laughs) The second reason, obviously, then is to to build up uh, that personal brand. I recognize that the only way to stand out in your target audience is to actually show up uh, and to build up that that personal brand. And then the the third reason as well was to build up my network. So as I was, um, you know, connecting with these guests, then I knew that I was going to be making friends with some of these. And actually a lot of the guests I've had on the podcast have become really good friends who've therefore become great referral partners and have been able to send great leads to us. Equally though, by running the podcast, we now have thousands upon thousands of downloads and we've um, developed a Facebook group uh, so we've got over 2,000 people in the Facebook group that talk with us regularly. We've got our membership as well, where we're giving people advice and help. Um, and we're publishing blogs and videos as well. So we have a, a whole suite of online, freely available content for people uh, to consume, which really, really elevates us and raises our profile. It's amazing for SEO as well. So I just quoted on a project just yesterday based on someone in Madrid who simply tapped in the words WordPress agency and I've asked us for a quote. Um, so, and, <laughs> and we literally spend zero on any sort of advertising. It's all content driven. I love that. And I think one thing that you have done extremely well when I compare to the average high street web designer is being out there, being visible as a person. I think web designers are probably the worst at hiding in their cupboards and not wanting to come out. Getting them to even network can Mm. be a struggle sometimes. So actually being a higher profile and building a personal brand is something they'd never even consider. I mean, I, I'll expand on that a little bit. I actually really do struggle with it. Um, I, I have very high anxiety. I do struggle with depression um, quite a lot. And um, I find it really overwhelming going to networking meetings, uh, getting on getting onto online calls a lot of the time. I, I, I find scary. Um, scary is probably the wrong word, but I get the anxiety, etc. Sometimes I just want to avoid it. Yeah. Um, and also, for example, going into the Upreneur Summit um, that we were all at, I found that very, very difficult. I'm, I guess I am actually really an introvert. I want to stay at home and hide away. I did find it difficult. And quite often when I was having conversations with people, I'd have to go and use the excuse that I just need to go to the restroom, uh, which just allowed me to go and decompress <laughs> in the toilet just to chill out for a minute, get my energy back up and then go back out there. Um, so the podcasting was that um, really, uh, blogging and podcasting was that kind of soft way in for me to start to build up my confidence to show up more and more and more because you're behind a microphone, aren't you? No one can see you. I can edit the podcast if I fluff something up. Uh, And over time, I've just built up that confidence and built up the mechanisms to help me do it. Um, Because I did five years ago try all of the automated stuff, you know, Facebook ads, Google AdWords, all that sort of stuff. And um, I... (sighs) I didn't show up. There was no pictures of me. It was all hiding behind a cartoon brand of me with a, with a tie on. (laughs) It looked awful. Uh, you know, and just nothing was working. But the minute I started to show up and create content, which was actually of value, I wasn't just saying, Hey, look at this. You websites probably really slow and just like boring stuff that no one cares about. Um, you know, I showed up with actual valuable valuable content and then built up that confidence through the podcast um, to the extent where I'm now doing the YouTube videos as well and being able to go out still struggle I'm still bricking it half the time but um, you know it's it's slowly built up that confidence I think it's just starting to do something really really helps um, you know just punching through that glass ceiling yeah I found much the same that I was really terrified at the beginning with the podcast but as soon Mm. as it was done it just felt quite natural 
No, I, I would never have. I, I didn't see that anxiety in you. It doesn't come across that way. So it's nice to hear it from you. That that's a, a common experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do hide it well. I did drama at school. Uh, <laughs> so that does help. That was one of the things I've always, always tried to act confident, even when I don't feel it. Because uh, when I start to act that role, then the confidence kind of naturally flows in afterwards. And then halfway through the meeting or whatever it was or the outing, I'm like, what was I worried about? You know, silly me. Yeah. And I also can't imagine you wearing No, a neither can I anymore. But I do have a video of me <laughs> wearing a suit without moving my arms for about four or five years ago. Uh, and you'll see the massive change. I'll show you the link. Maybe you can put it in the notes. And it's me <laughs> um, saying, are you a design agency? And I just look terrified. I'm in a suit. It's clearly not me. It's clearly not my personality. Um, and although the content of the video is good, it's, um, you know, the actual video was awful and it didn't show my personality and it didn't really convert very well. Um, and you can then see the difference in me nowadays. One of the things I'd like to look at is you've done something quite neat in your business, which is unusual for a web designer in the way that you've, you mentioned at the beginning, several revenue streams. There's, mm -hmm. there's the actual client work that you do, but then you've also got a membership site. Uh, and you've got some sort of more productized WordPress plugins and things like that. How did you come to that? Because again, that's quite unusual for a website. Uh, well, I think for me, uh, one of the things I learned many years ago in my old um, business was that you really don't want to store all your eggs in one basket. So one of the common um, c common uh, agency problems might be you've got one or two really big clients, and if they go, you're screwed. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, rewind 15 years ago, I've been there. I've had clients who've just disappeared overnight or they've suddenly realized they've got the balance of power and they just nail you down on price and stuff like that. And it really, really affects you. So, uh, since that experience, I've never wanted to repeat it ever again. So, um, the reason we've gone through those multiple streams of revenue, we've got, I've got two companies and my other company I don't talk about so much is the licensing that licenses the software that we've made in the events industry. Um, so that pays me salary. We've got a team involved in that. And that keeps, uh, you know, that keeps food on the table and everything. It's a, it's a lovely business that I don't have to do too much in. That's Event Engine, is that right? Yeah, that's Event Engine. That's right. And then, um, obviously, the Angled Crown uh, business serves to um, uh, essentially fund all the work I do with the personal brand. But equally, the personal brand then feeds those two businesses with great projects or great licensing, etc. So, just allowed me to spread. Um, out the sources of revenue that I have um, as a person, but also as a business. Mm. Um, equally, the purpose behind the community, which is another source of revenue, um, is less about revenue there. It's more about covering some of those costs um, with regards to the work that we are doing, you know, the content creation, et cetera. But the other more important thing is uh, is helping us in our mission. Um, my My mission, really, and I think every every company needs to have some sort of mission. My mission is to help other agencies not have all of the mistakes that I made, you know, 15, 10 years ago, et cetera, and help them find better ways of, of operating. So that's why I created the the community as well alongside of the, the podcast. And it helps me learn as well, because I, I don't know who said it. Some wise person once said that we learn best through teaching. Um, as long as I'm keeping teaching i'm having to keep on top of this sort of stuff as well which can only benefit me and my businesses as well yeah no you're absolutely right one thing i'd like to maybe pivot into is talking about wordpress because you're a wordpress agency and i'm not going to have a wordpress expert on this podcast very often so i'm going to make the most of it <laughs> um, yeah. uh, wordpress is one of these things that people dabble in but as somebody that has run a website agency they also come with an awful lot of risk. The more WordPress websites you stack up in your hosting, mm -hmm. the more risk you're building in. What should the average business owner, because I would say most businesses these days, if they're building a website, it's probably on WordPress. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest mistakes you see people making with WordPress? Sure thing. Um, so, well, there, there is an awful lot. So I'll try and just reel off just a few of what I think are the most common. Ugh. So, and, and, and just to help frame the question. So this is just the general business owner who has self-built a WordPress site or they've had a WordPress site built by someone else? I guess or I would say both because let's face it, most small web design companies, once they've delivered a website, it's delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, the risk is then on, on the business owner. They have to maintain it. 
Yeah, okay. Well, then, based on that, the absolute 100 biggest, 100% biggest mistake people make is not maintaining their WordPress website and not paying for that. Um, so you imagine you've built your website. Um, within a few weeks, the plugins that you have and WordPress have probably already been updated to cover specific vulnerabilities or to help improve speed of certain functions, etc. So many uh, business owners will just leave their site as it is and potentially never, ever update it. Um, the business owners that do update it probably shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> they should probably be paying an expert to maintain that for them. So just like you would have your car maintained so that it doesn't clog up and slow down, etc. So you'll send it in for a service every year. Uh, you really need to service a WordPress website or a Drupal website for that matter. Any of these online uh, software products need to be serviced regularly. And um, people will challenge me on that and I would challenge them back because if you look at your operating system, be that Windows or be that your Mac, you probably have some sort of cleaning device that you have to, sorry, cleaning software that you have to run to maintain it because your registry will fill up, uh, your temporary files will fill up on all of that sort of stuff. And you'll find that over time, the operating system can slow down unless you keep it maintained. So that's definitely the biggest issue uh, people um, have with their WordPress sites. The other um, big deal uh, that I make quite often is that people will just grab any theme off, say, Theme Forest or maybe a free theme off uh, the WordPress repository and not do their due diligence to make sure that that theme has been well built, that it actually gives them what they need, etc. So they end up yeah. cobbling then together lots of other plugins to try and fill gaps. But then when people are picking those plugins, again, they're not doing that due diligence. Sometimes people are picking plugins that haven't actually been updated by people for many, many years, or the plugin maybe doesn't even do what they need to do because they didn't spend the time to investigate and test on a test environment. They just went ahead, installed it, found it didn't work, and then either left it there and added something new or removed it, but all of its data was still in the database, etc. cetera. So um, th they're some of the main issues. Um, I think as well as a business owner, if you are not a web developer, um, you should probably be looking to have it built by a professional as well, rather than spending hours and hours trying to build something that might be uh, subpar and then trying to support it yourself. I think that's another mistake that entrepreneurs specifically would make. Um, yeah. There's, there's way more. I could keep going, I guess, <laughs> if, you, if you want me to. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's already um, very specific and enough for most people to take on board. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to look at is you describe yourself as a build agency. You're not doing the design work. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process behind that? Because part of me would say, well, yeah, if you did the design work, you can charge more. But clearly you have a rationale behind that. Oh, absolutely. Um well, first of all, there are a lot of agency design agencies, sorry, who aren't necessarily charging more for the design. Um, the cost of entry is dropping both for web development and also for design. I mean, you can go onto 99designs, can't you now, and, and get a brand for, say, three or 400 quid. I mean, it may not necessarily be good, but um, people have access through the internet to a whole range of different ways of getting design done. So uh, uh, that was the first thing for me. Um, cost of entry is plummeting for design uh, in certain areas. And um, th there's also a lot of people in my industry offering design. However, I do know that I can help those designers who don't necessarily know how to do the development. Um, so for me, I, I recognize that I'm not the best designer. I can design, but I'm not the best designer. But me and my team are amazing on WordPress and we love doing code. We love developing. Um, so why don't we do what we love and try and help those people um, who are doing what they love, which is the design. So um, all these designers who are perhaps struggling with revenue streams because they're battling for the lower and lower design jobs can maybe start to increase their offering by offering the higher scale websites as well along with their designs uh, rather than trying to rely on a freelancer to help them build something i mean a common problem for a design agency for example will be that they'll say all right well let's start building websites for people we can design a brochure so surely we can design a website yeah. and then we'll just get that guy from uh, i don't know from people per hour to, to build it for us uh, so you send the designs over, you're like, how long is this going to take? Mm, yeah, a couple of weeks. Uh, it's going to cost you 500 quid. Oh, great. And then you, you know, mark that up and charge it onto the client. And before you know it, um, it's taken weeks and weeks and weeks. The site doesn't look anything like your design and it's just a complete nightmare and you've ruined your client relationship. So, uh, that's, that's why we set ourselves up to, to help, to not be that, uh, you know, to, to fill that gap. So yes, we're expensive, but we can help those, um, 
those designers uh, offer a high end service and and they make money, we make money, everyone's a winner. Um, and, and what do you do when you get a design that's unbuildable? How do you handle that? Well, in theory, there is no design that is unbuildable, but uh, there is a limit to people's budgets. So the way we would quote on something um, is, is that we may be provided a sitemap without a design, so we're able to give them a rough idea on, okay, we think you're probably going to have to invest this much money. Um, when, but we'll then say subject to designs and the the visual brief because obviously the visual brief is going to come in. They're going to say, hey, and we need this person to fly in uh, and land on the top of that building. And when you <laughs> hover over their nose, it should spin. Uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously that's not what the brief is, but it's an example of some people get a little bit crazy on what they think wants to happen on the actual website when it gets to that point. Um, so at that point, we'll say, well, that's fine. We can do that. Now, bearing in mind that's going to be some custom animation we're going to need you to slice up all the imagery etc so we're going to need to add on x amount of hundreds of pounds to this project to enable that person to fly in etc so are you happy to proceed and very often people say yeah actually nah it's probably a bit too gimmicky isn't it i'm like yeah it's definitely too gimmicky shall we not do it yeah let's not do it um so <clears throat> that's the important part of the whole discovery process and you know, when we're receiving the designs, we will have everything written down as to what we're going to do with those designs. And then we can, you know, that's then handed off over, signed off, and then we can do the build. So we're not expecting to be doing endless rounds of amends to the development, trying to make noses spin around on people's faces, etc. Yeah. Also, in most cases, everything is possible. You know, the, the internet has grown up a lot um, five, ten years ago certain things wouldn't be possible but now with everyone having much more modern browsers with webkit all of that sort of stuff it's so much easier to do stuff that may have been really really you know really hard a few years ago you know you can even do gradients and drop shadows and you can do great animations all with css you don't even need jquery etc so mm. most things are achievable anyway nowadays which is also a relief yeah, with internet explorer being canned um, edge looks like it's going to be canned soon but at least it handles things a lot better than internet explorer did so yeah Sorry, I went to super tech then. No, no, that's I, there's there's all kinds out there. Want to listen to all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I'd like to look at again is your business model. As a web designer, is quite unusual. I mean, I, I know a lot of web design businesses, and they tend to be quite linear, um, and their growth plans tend to be quite linear. In that, the assumption is the only way you can grow a website business is by doing more work and charging more for that work. Um, and it really is just a numbers game. The more bodies, the more work you can do. If you're going to grow up beyond a certain point, you probably need to bring in some sales team. Clearly not where you're going. How do you see Angled Crown growing? Um, okay, so like I explained, every company should have some sort of mission. And I know it sounds very woo-woo, um, but having a, a mission in life of how you want to change the world in some sort of way, what your legacy is going to be, is really, really important. Because if you don't have that, you're going to just keep doing more of the same and not even be 100% sure as to why you're doing it. So five years ago, six years ago, how long it is when I started Angle Crown, I was thinking, I want to reduce the stress of agency life. And the only way I can think of doing it right now is by at least filling this gap in the market, which is you know, being a development agency and removing the stress of all those freelancers. So that mission, though, has continued to be my mission. So that's therefore grown our vision. The vision then became the podcast. How can we help more people, maybe even for free, but at least it still helps us with our mission by sharing information and interviewing people, etc. That then led into how can we help people uh, you know, make change in their in their agency, reducing that stress. Great. Well, let's build up this um, the uh, uh, the membership where we can give them some deep dive education and maybe do calls with them, etc. So our ongoing plan is we're still being true to the five years ago. Um, we're still building sites for agencies, but we're also being able to do other things for our agency. So say in another five years time, um, I'm predicting the book, I'm predicting a yearly event in the UK, hopefully an event in the USA as well, where agency owners are all get, able to get together and help each other out and learn from from the experts, etc. I'm also um, going to be doing a mastermind. Uh, so that'd be a more high level mastermind for certain groups of agency owners that want to make massive transformation in their agency. So there are all these things that we will be doing to grow 
the business, which all go with that original mission of how can we reduce stress in agency life? How can we help agency owners live their agency again? Um, and, and we talk about that all the time. How does this help an agency owner love their agency again? Because 15 years ago, I hated my agency. I didn't want to do it. Um, I was trapped. Uh, I had clients who were horrible. Do you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm sure people recognize this in many different businesses. So, you know, and, and so many agencies are closing down because of it when actually if they can make changes, they don't need to close. So, yeah, I waffled. I think I answered your question. No, you absolutely <laughs> did. And I think too many business owners, is that particularly in web design, you really suffer from a very low horizon mm. that really all you can see is the next few weeks, the next few months, making payroll for the next month. And everything is driven by that. And clearly you're not... Um, and I think that's really quite inspiring. Thanks, buddy. Well, 15 years ago, it was driven by what was the next project because I needed to put food on the table. Yeah. Uh, and I needed to pay all these members of staff. And, uh, and and that's a route that you get stuck in, in a cycle that just seems endless, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and what's most interesting and most most inspiring is that you've escaped that by giving value. Um, mm -hmm. Giving value in in ways that many people would think of as feeding your competition in many regards. Well, I, I guess not though, because remember you have called me a web designer a few times. I'm a web developer. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm... laughs> so actually I've been helping my target audience because yeah. even though they're web developers and web designers, they're uh, some of them are probably going to use me at some point, but yeah. equally I can still help them. Yeah, no, I get that. The last question I have, and I probably got it in the wrong order, but for me, this has always been a bit of a struggle. Um, when you are a web developer um, mm -hmm. and you're working largely for other agencies, you s sometimes, and certainly in my experience, most of the time, you suffer from not actually having that relationship with the end user client. In order for you to deliver value, you must have found a way to actually make that work. Do you know the yes. kind of question? I'm I know exactly what you mean. So um, uh, we don't want to be playing Chinese whispers all the time, do we? And um, uh, so the way the way we operate, there's two different ways we operate on any project and we insist on either one of these two ways so that we can give the best value either number one we are uh, the agency is transparent and they say this is our partner development company they're coming in for the meetings they're coming on the calls and um, they're going to help uh, build up the the overall proposal they're going to help uh, build up the project plan etc so we'll do project management and everything we're not just simply give us your designs and we'll code we are giving you the full service there of helping you uh, with your client and we're involved in those original conversations we get to influence the client and find ways of adding value etc um, so that's the first preferred method so that there's no kind of cloak and dagger smoke and mirrors and and you know, uh, passing on messages. The other way that we do work um, less often, but if the agency wants, is uh, that we will then um, uh, we'll either have a member of staff uh, that works for them, as it were. Uh, they work for us, but they, they'll work on their account and or I will or someone will, and we'll be a representative of that business, i.e. white labeled. So when we're involved in those conversations, I'm Lee from you know, XYZ agency from strawberry solutions or whatever, because <laughs> uh, agencies like to use fruit and veg, don't they? As their, uh, as their agency names. That's the I, two I, ways. Uh, it, it just still allows us to have those conversations with the client. Cause otherwise if, if we're doing the Chinese whispers, it's not going to work. Yeah. I think those are the only two ways it can work. Um, Absolutely. I've been in a situation where you're hiding behind the agency, the agency don't really acknowledge your existence and it's just a nightmare. And it just costs money. Absolutely. I guess I should give you an opportunity to um, let people connect with you. So if people want to connect with you, how would you like them to do that? Absolutely. Well, it would be great to have a conversation. You can find our corporate website on angledcrown.com. That's angledcrown.com. Um, or if you want to go and check out the podcast, that's agencytrailblazer.com. And if you want to send me a message, feel free to jump on to Facebook and ping me a message that way. I'll, uh, uh, if you want to pop my um, link in the uh, in the show notes, mate, they can certainly ping me a message because I kind of live on Facebook. I'll literally. do that. Facebook is open on my screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Jackson from Angled Crown and Agency Trailblazer. Thank you so much for making the time for me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I could get really, really nerdy on websites, but I've, I've managed to avoid it mostly. You are very self-controlled. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lee. I'd like to catch up with you again sometime next year when I'm a little bit better at this. I'd love that. You were great, though. <laughs> Thanks Cheers, very mate. much. Bye.
I really admire what Lee's done with his business. If you run any kind of business yourself, you'll know how hard it is to make big changes to your client base. And what I think Lee shows is that big changes in your business often need big changes in you. If you run a digital agency or you're just thinking of stepping out on your own, then I have something for you. I've been working on a book outline, but from the early notes I've put together a short agency playbook, The Six Keys to Unlock Success in Your Digital Agency, and it's yours for free. Just visit my website, bobgentle.com, and grab your copy. As always, and I don't ask this lightly ever, please do take a second to review this show on iTunes. You won't imagine the impact this has, but trust me, it makes a massive difference to me and to the show. My name's Bob Gentle. Thanks again to Lee for making the time. Don't forget to check out Angled Crown online. And thank you to you for listening. And see you next time.